both my kids are are very responsive to um, the climate crisis that we're in, and they realize that, and they're 14 and 11, the likelihood of them getting a driver's license, even wanting to drive, is that's that's literally not on the table for them. Um, they want to be able to get around uh, by by bike, by walking, by public transit. They want to do that uh, throughout, you know, their their lives here in Toronto. And um, it's going to be up to myself, up to my wife, to really amplify their needs. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that was Lanrick Bennett Jr. Uh, Lanrick is the bicycle mayor of Toronto, Canada, and uh, you may recall that I interviewed Maude DeVries, the co-founder of the Bikes Program, the organization that has the Bicycle Mayor uh, Initiative. It is a global initiative where they're identifying members of the community that can help move the bicycle message forward, the need for safer infrastructure, uh, getting people engaged and encouraging more people to ride more often. Uh, it is a fabulous conversation. I'm so delighted to share this with you. Uh, so let's get right to it with Lenrick. Lenrick, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Hey, thank you so very much for the invite. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. We are going to have a lot of fun, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Uh, why don't we do this? Um, we're going to we're going to go into uh, you know some of the the nitty gritty details of of your position that you hold, very a formal position uh, there in Toronto. But uh, why don't you just take a, a quick moment to uh, you know share with the audience a little bit about yourself? Wow. Okay. Well, uh, again, uh, I'm Landrick Bennett Jr. I live here in the city of Toronto. Uh, I have, uh, I've been anointed, anointed, I've been uh, uh, put forth as the new uh, bicycle mayor here in Toronto. Uh, a An awesome position, you don't get a sash, you don't get a crown, uh, but uh, you're, you're connected through a, a very um, uh, amazing network of other mayors across uh, the world, an organization in the Netherlands uh, called Bikes BYCS uh, organizes different uh, areas throughout uh, the world where we can all come together, understanding the significance and uh, the the real understanding of how bikes, bicycles, uh, this this biking network in general uh, can really uh, make cities a more livable place. Uh, I am a I'm really a newbie when it comes to uh, cycling in general. Um, I blame my kids. Uh, they definitely want to be able to cycle around uh, the city and uh, have pushed me to become uh, uh, an advocate, uh, a voice uh, that gets to connect with other voices throughout uh, a city of 3 million people where we're very car centric here in uh, Toronto, very car dependent. And uh, cycling, biking, uh, public transit, active transportation is still seen as uh, something on the side, as a uh, ad piece. And uh, being the bicycle mayor, it's it's really my my job and 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 my want to be able to amplify and push out uh, any and all reasons to get on a bike to make it safer for people and to make sure that that conversation is continuous. Fantastic. Yeah. And I had the honor of uh, having uh, Maude DeVries on the mm. uh, the podcast a, a few episodes ago. And so uh, we talked a little bit about the history of uh, launching uh, bikes, the organization and the Bicycle mm. uh, Mayor Network. And it truly is a global initiative. I mean, you look at the, the number of locations around the globe, uh, many, many uh, that are popping up in India right now, which is yes. super, super cool yeah. to see. Um, and so <laughs> we can see that North America, we need a little bit more. And, uh, and that's, but it's so cool that, that, you know, that you were, you know, part of this been sort of elected did slash volunteered. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about that story. How, how did that all, all come about? 
Yeah, you know, I was uh, working for an organization called 880 Cities, uh, oh, no yeah. longer with them. Yeah, great, great organization looking at cities, looking at streets through the lens of an eight-year-old and an 80-year-old and figuring that if if you can have that that lens where everyone can uh, can be able to uh, play, uh, be able to um uh, get around safely. Uh, that's a city that we all want to be a part of. So I was with that organization. And uh, when the bicycle mayor piece kind of came up, uh, I had a few friends that were just like, you should really be getting into this. Uh, and a few reference letters later, uh, uh, connected with uh, bikes. And uh, I, I think for them, and I think it was quite funny because I started this mayoral uh, ship in uh, January and cycling in Toronto in January is a bit uh, daunting to say the least. Uh, so uh, the rollout was maybe a bit slower than uh, than we wanted, but uh, the the uh, openness of the cycling community here in Toronto and the conversations that I'm having um, honestly throughout the world right now when it comes to cycling has been uh, amazing. And it really is, uh, it's a testament to bikes and what they've already put forth, but also just for this pent up uh, uh, usage of, of bicycles. And I mean, the pandemic surely had a hand in getting a lot of people to dust off what was in their uh, garages, you know, taking stuff out of their laneways and and kind of seeing this this machine uh, that can get them from point A to point B without, you know, having to turn on an engine. Um, the, the big thing here in Toronto, and, and we may get uh, into a bit more of this, is the infrastructure. And it's creating that safe infrastructure, not just to get you from uh, a a from your house to uh, you know a a recreational uh, track, but we want to get you to work. We want to get you to school. We want to get you to fun. Uh, we want to get uh, everywhere that you possibly could in a car. Uh, but being able to do that on a bike is it's it's a it's a whole different uh, category of of wonderfulness when uh, you can ride to your destinations. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to go back over here to, to this little uh, landing page for, for you out on the, the, the website here. And I think that one of the things that is incredibly important to recognize, because you mentioned that you, this is new to you, that, you know, yeah. certainly the, the bikes in general are new to you. It, not super, super new, but Mm. relatively new officially new um <laughs> and certainly the advocacy side is new but you honed right in on on something that has been one of our key weaknesses in um the safe streets movement and the the bicycle advocacy movement since that we're way too white <laughs> it's just like it's it's laughable how it is sad and and and, yeah. and you can cry but it's also laughable just how white the movement has been and how, you know, unrepresented, uh, you know, the BIPOC community has been in, in doing this. And, you know, it's, it's so refreshing. It's a breath of fresh air when we see new people get engaged and get going and saying, well, why the hell not? Let's, let's, let's get, let's do this and let's engage this. Um, because when we look at the statistics, we see that these are exactly the communities that are most um, impacted negatively by the streets that we have and the networks that we have. Talk a little bit about that and why you're so passionate about doing this from that perspective. You know, I, I'm a black man. I'm a black man that uh, enjoys writing. I enjoy going across uh, my city here in uh, Toronto. But uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous being a black male uh, in, in our society right now. And being able to safely get from point A to point B can sometimes be challenging. Um, my hope, uh, and I've got a two-year term, uh, is to get more people that look like me wanting to be on bicycles, uh, wanting to um, be a part of what is 
what is really, as you say, it's it's definitely much more white than uh, maybe uh, uh, we would like as as a, a person of color, but definitely something where we want to make sure that um, the privilege that uh, many have is is equitably uh, put forth for everyone. Yeah. And you sent over a few photos of, of what I would imagine is probably some interviews <laughs> that kind of popped up. Uh, what's the story behind this, uh, this little shoot here? Yeah, you're seeing uh, one, of the, um, one of the things that kind of popped up uh, during the pandemic was the fact that um, we are, there's a huge uh, disparity between people that have food and people that don't. I uh, volunteer and I'm a board member with an organization called the Bike Brigade. And uh, what the Bike Brigade does is they look at um, the surrounding area. We partner with different food uh, specific non for profits and we use our bikes to drop off uh, food across the city. Um, food uh, insecurity is a is a huge, huge, huge problem here in the city of Toronto. And being able to utilize our bikes to safely get uh, our our food to uh, people that need it, um, it was it was a it was a wonderful use of bikes in general. Uh, definitely um, uh, something that I'm really happy that I've been able to put some time and effort into. Um, I get to I get to cycle across the city. I get to help uh, my community out by uh, taking really precious cargo, food, uh, to their doorstep, to their front door, and um, it's it's. The organization itself is only two years old. I mean, it literally came about uh, because of the pandemic, but even as we go forward uh, past the last two years, this is, it's a, it's an organization, the, the Bike Brigade, that's going to continue onwards uh, as we understand that food insecurity is, is such a widespread um, uh, problem in our city and being on a bike, being able to utilize uh, that tool to help, um, can't go wrong with that. Yeah. Earlier you referenced the bike as, is the machine. Is this your machine? That's my machine. <laughs> <laughs> Bungee cords and all. I love it. I love uh, it. <laughs> so, well, and, and, it, and it reinforces the fact that uh, uh, any bike can become a cargo bike. You know, get those pan. Right. You know, get that rack back there. You know, put some panniers on. Get some bungee cords. You can do some stuff on the cheap. You don't have to go for the expensive stuff. If you can get to that point, you know, and you are able to do a, a cargo bike, more power to you. If you're Fair. able to get electric assist, more power to you, <laughs> literally. <laughs> because you'll be able to get more places and get more food right. into the, the hands or get to work, you know, yeah. in, 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 in a, uh, especially in hot you know, environments, you know, be it's like being able to, being able to get there just a little less That's damp, right. damp. Yes. Um, <laughs> so what's really powerful though, about this movement is that the whole reason it exists is that point that you just made about the infrastructure. Talk a little bit more deeply about the challenge, uh, that you all face in Toronto. Toronto is a big city. And um, from a North American perspective, it's one of the more bike friendly cities, uh, which isn't saying much, um, especially when you compare it to its, you know, its sort of peer cities in, in Canada, sure. when, you know, sure. comparing it to Montreal, comparing it to Vancouver, uh, it's got a long way to go. But on the ground for you and your family in your neighborhood and the places that you go to on a regular basis, What's the biggest challenge? You know, as I said, I started riding, uh, you know, because of my kids. Uh, my daughter specifically wanted uh, to ride to school. And we, my wife and I, we had bought her a bike and riding around the neighborhood. Yeah, she was great at that at eight or nine. Uh, and one day she just came into the kitchen and she was like, I want to be able to ride to school. And that was it. That that was her. That was her. You know, that's what she threw out to us. 
And uh, my wife looked at me and she was like, I'm already at work, you know, at uh, 645 in the morning. Do you think you could ride with Zoe? And, you know, the next weekend I go out, I buy myself a bike and I'm riding with my daughter to to school. Um, it was awesome. It was awesome being with her, uh, allowing her to feel uh, this this. Uh, sense of ownership and this sense of adventure and being able to 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 take this bike and uh, and go to school, but uh, and and this is the big but that really stops a lot of people from uh, wanting to ride here in this city is that the infrastructure that we have um, it's paint. Uh, the majority of our cycling infrastructure in Toronto is just paint. And because of this, uh, my daughter would be in the bike lane uh, in paint, and I would be in the road as some sort of force field uh, for her. And um, as we would continue to ride and, and as we got better and faster and, and would find you know, new uh, nooks and crannies, uh, unfortunately, um, a, another father uh, was killed on our opposite route, uh, Street uh, Jones Avenue and uh, Dundas. Uh, Douglas Crosby uh, had, had been uh, crashed into. And uh, just making a regular right-hand turn, um, completely just, I'm saying this very selfishly, completely threw a wrench in my daughter's headspace of um, wanting to ride to school. Um she lasted maybe three months after his death and she went on strike and my daughter has not actually been on a bike in four years. And this is after contacting uh, our local politicians, um, you know, making noise on the fact that she wanted not just safe streets for herself, uh, but for her community, for her friends, for her teachers. Um, and, you know, we've, we've gotten bit, pieces of protective cycling infrastructure, but it's nearly not enough. Um, and I want to, you know, preface that by, you know, just putting forth that we have an amazing transportation department here in Toronto. We have actually a department that is specifically put forth for uh, cycling infrastructure. The problem is we've got a city of 3 million people. Yeah. And because of that, you need local, you need your counselor, you need your locally elected official to have the political will to step up and say, we need stuff here. We need stuff now. And uh, unfortunately for, for where I live in my neighborhood, uh, we don't have that, that, that same political uh, uh, push to, yeah. uh, to get cycling infrastructure here. You said it. We need the political will. Boom. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah. Let's uh let's hear from Zoe herself. Dear Infrastructure and Environment Committee, which includes James Pasternak, Miles Cole, Mike Layton, Denzel Manning Long, Anthony Peruza, and Jennifer McKelvey. I'm a black girl. I am almost twelve years old. I used to ride my bike to school with my dad. Two years ago, Douglas Crosby was killed at Dundas Street East and Jones Avenue in Toronto, Danforth. This was my halfway point on my route to school at, at Duke of Connacht. For my entire existence, there has not been a safe ride for girls like me to ride to school on any, uh, to any school on Jones Avenue or Dundas Street East. That includes Earl Grey, Blake Street, Queen Alexandra, Dundas Public School, Leslieville Junior Public School, and my school, Duke. I don't know if you have said no to Paula Fletcher and, and Jennifer's story, but I want you to say yes to every girl that looks like me. Every girl that wants to have a protective bike lane to get them to school safely and back home safely to their parents. My community needs this. My environment needs this. My life needs this. This is my demand on International Women's Day. My name is Zoe Elizabeth Bennett, and I create Black History 365 days a year. Thank you. So, oh, wow. <laughs> talk about powerful. Uh, yeah. Um, so, 
you know, you said it earlier, you know, and, and we saw it in, in, in that footage there. It's, it, you know, most of North America, um, the approach uh, to bike lanes, to bike networks was a simple painted line. And, mm -hmm. you know, the mantra that, that we have in the movement right now um, is, you know, paint is not protection. Right. Yeah. Paint yeah. is not protection. Um, now, um, yeah, available out on the Active Town store. <clears throat> yeah. Um, now, that, that being said, we can use some, we can use paint in creative ways and paint is yeah. actually helping us tremendously. Uh, the, the asphalt art movement of, of using paint as traffic calming and, and creating some very creative intersection crossings and intersections to help slow traffic down and traffic calming. So we're not talking about that. When we're being yeah. critical of paint and saying paint is not protection, we're literally talking about stop putting down simple four inches of, or six inches of a white you're line lucky. and thinking you're done and go, okay. Yeah, we, yeah. Are you happy now, bi bicyclists? You know, <laughs> you cyclists, are you happy? Um, the other thing I like to say too, is that sometimes you can use paint strategically as a bike mm -hmm. lane to create um, space that then can be, you know, come back and put in authentic protection. And we call that a buffered bike lane. Uh, we can do that again. It's still not protection. And even if you put the flex posts in there, it's still not protection, <laughs> but at least it's a real estate placeholder. And sometimes that's the interim step that is necessary for a city to be able to get to, um, you know, that point of being able to get to that next step. And sometimes it's the necessary evil of being able to, to create that political will Fair. of being able to say that, you know, hey, at least we reserve the space. We created a buffer. We've got a little bit of protection in there. And we're going to prove to the naysayers and to the, the haters that the earth didn't stop spinning and then come <laughs> back when you have the funding to be able to, to put in authentic protection. So uh, I just wanted to say that because, you know, it, sometimes you, you, you get some negative reaction of saying, you know, well, you, you just, you know, paint is not protection. You're, you're, I mean, that's not helping. It's like, well, actually, it kind of is, because what we're trying to point out is that um, you, cities just can't, you know, wash their hands of it and, and think that they're done because they put in, a, you know, a simple bike lane. Um, and you're, and you are correct. You, you, the, the city of Toronto does have a pretty amazing, um, group of people who are out there working hard. Um, but I think one of the things that is, is coming up is we realize we need to be moving much quicker. There's yeah. a sense of urgency. We've got, you know, we've got climate issues, <laughs> You know, we, we were talking before we hit the record button of the fact that, you know, I, I've been immersed in, in hundred degree, you know, weather, you know, 38 plus degrees Celsius forever down here in, in Texas. And it's, and it's ridiculous. Uh, but we also have a sense of urgency that has to take place because um, our roadway networks are, are simply hostile to anyone not in a motor vehicle. Say a few words about what we're going to hear in this second clip that you sent to me. Um, set this up for us. Oh, wow. Uh, so this is Miguel. Miguel was, uh, was um, crashed into by, uh, by a truck at University and Bloor uh, in downtown Toronto. Um, and this was for, uh, this was just before uh, heading off to a, to a ghost ride. Uh, we are all vulnerable road users. So that's pedestrians, that's cyclists, uh, that's people outside of uh, cars. And it is so completely apparent that every time you set foot onto these streets, these public streets. These are, these are streets that anyone should be able to access. 
uh, were built specifically for the movement of cars, trucks. Um, and there needs to be a complete change in that dynamic of um, being able to really understand that uh, my life, my friends' lives, my neighbors' lives, my kids' lives are as important as any driver. And until we can uh, find that equitable balance uh, between a 3,000 pound minimum vehicle and myself and, you know, uh, uh, the wind, um, it, it, it's going to be, it's going to be dangerous. It's going to be, uh, um, just, just scary out there. Yeah. I like to remind people though, that, um, these, these streets weren't really built for cars. Mm, mm. If it's an older city, you know, if you're talking a historic city, this, the car is actually the invader. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. literally streets have been in our uh, habitat for thousands of years. And so the, the car, which is an invention that, you know, came around right about 120 years ago, mm. give or take, it kind of took over 100 years ago into the 20s and 30s. And that's when we started seeing fatality rates starting to tick up. Right. But they're the, they're the invader of public space. And our streets have always served as the platform for commerce and sociability and wealth creation, da 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 da, da. So in, in, in actuality, the motor vehicle is uh, an insidious invader in that space, in that context. And so I like to try to, to really look at human that, habitat. That's, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's roll this because I think this is incredibly powerful. Uh, there is a little bit of background noise uh, to this video, um, but we'll hopefully it's hopefully everybody can hear it. Um, and if not, I'll I'll actually clean the audio up and then and splice it in here. But let's give it a roll. It it, it doesn't make sense. I don't know how we can't prioritize the life of a human being over a car, over a truck, over construction, over... I don't know why we need to have blood spilled on our streets to have our elected officials realize that, oh my gosh, we've got to do something. Paint's not going to be enough. Eh. And this young man, I, I... I don't know why other people have to die. I just, I don't get it. I really don't. Yeah, <laughs> don't get it. Um, yeah, and 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 that's why I wanted to make sure that we we, we talked about paint is not enough. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you bring up a really good point there, and that is, why does it have to, to take blood being spilled for politicians to 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 mm -hmm. wake up to this? Are they are they waking up to it? Never enough, uh, not quick enough, uh, not with uh, enough vigor to uh, make sure that uh, a death like that never happens again. Um, and, and maybe that's why we do, we do these uh, uh, ghost rides is to um, show the community, show our politicians that um, you and I, doesn't matter if you're on a bike, if you're walking, if you're in a car, we are human beings and we deserve the same protection and rights that anyone else would have. And, um, you know, we have our political champions. We have those that are able to uh, uh, put their voice forward and put that uh, political know-how into creating uh, these uh, creative and crafty uh, cycling uh, infrastructure pieces. Um, but that's, it, 
there's no cut and paste to that. Uh, what happens is, and I see this a lot here in my city, is that we've got areas that are uh, truly, you know, cycling focused. And uh, then we, uh, we, we're not able to copy and paste that into other parts of, uh, of uh, the city. And it's, and it's so unfortunate. It's so unfortunate. It sounds like what you're saying is that uh, in some sectors of the city, um, I can think of like the downtown area where you've got some nice protected uh, infrastructure. Um, when I was there for NACTO a few years ago, it was the, at the time, it was the planter protected uh, mm -hmm. sort of a, 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 a an interim step. I know that they were going to want to put in permanent infrastructure at some point in time. Um, is what you're saying is that Geez, some some parts of the community aren't getting that same level of treatment. <laughs> kind of amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That that equitable uh, bubble, um, and again, a, a lot of this is political will. Right. Uh, a lot of this is is having that politician that doesn't necessarily even need to be a cyclist, but just wants to make sure that their streets are safer. Right. Um, uh, that isn't an across the board mindset. Uh, so you really do have a patchwork uh, here in Toronto. Uh, yeah, our downtown core uh, from the um, from the west side of of the Don River to the east side of the Humber. Uh, that is a, a focal point of uh, cycling infrastructure that works, right. and you see it work on a daily basis. I'm coming out from the East End, and I'm very lucky to have uh, what's called uh, Destination Danforth. And this was the expansion of what you saw uh, across Bloor Street, takes you across uh, the Don River and brings you almost to uh, to Scarborough, which is wonderful, but it's one street, right. uh, one protected street, but it's one street. And to have everyone try and, you know, either come from the North End down South or come from the South, uh, to the north, you want a grid. So you're 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 looking at that's a wonderful picture of a of a pre uh, destination Danforth with my son. But yeah, you want that everywhere. You don't just need it in this sliver. Uh, and and what happens is um, you almost have politicians going, "Hey, see, we did it. We're yeah. we're done now, right? We we we've done we've done." Everything that you've asked for, we've just put it all in one place. And, uh, you know, yeah. thanks. And, and there's no continuous want uh, to to make noise. So, yeah, you're you're really you're really pushing on those politicians to go see. We did it. And, and I mean, you're showing a picture right now of Destination Danforth and my son and I are riding on the pre setup. This is six, six, almost seven kilometers of. Uh, a street that was transformed from being two lanes of traffic going back and forth with parking to now one lane of uh, drivable east-west plus a protected bike lane. So you're seeing the paint there as just the setup. Before it was even open, they had the planters put in before uh, it was opened up to the public. So we instantaneously had uh, a protective corridor uh, taking you east and west, which was amazing uh but i'm not seeing that to the south i'm not seeing that to the north this street doesn't help to to take you to schools or to work that isn't on the danforth that's where we need to start really activating uh the the understanding and want uh to protect vulnerable road users yeah yeah in your your comments, uh, uh, you know, just before the ghost ride, uh, you talked about, you know, why are we prioritizing the movement of these motor vehicles and all of those things? Mm. The other thing that that came to mind is so often we're also just prioritizing the storage of motor vehicles, the parking, you know, because that's one of yeah. the one of the key battles that takes place is that, well, gosh, you know, we've got some limited space on our roadway. Um we're going to have to remove some on-street parking and then, quote unquote, all hell breaks loose because, <laughs> you know, you think that you're, you know, the world is going to end if, you know, you, you don't have the ability to park and store your private property on a public right of way. Public. Yeah, so yeah. I just thought I'd 
throw that no, out that's there. Very, very true. Very yeah. true. And I mean, the and my last little thing about Destination Danforth is wonderful as it is. Uh, we know we could have done better if if we had uh, the ability to remove uh, the street parking. Yeah. Um, the the wonderful thing is is that cars don't don't buy stuff; people do, right. and you're more likely to have a person come off of their bike uh, to go into your store, purchase that piece, get right back on their bike, and go than you ever will having someone driving around trying to find parking. They do; they kind of look in and. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's trying to change that narrative. I'll hit play on this, uh, this, um, <laughs> little movie. Why don't you narrate it as we, as we go here? Oh gosh, I, I, I think it's going to narrate itself. Uh, <laughs> my, my son, Jack here, we're, we're riding, uh, um, westbound on the Danforth. The, the crazy thing about this little video here is that, Almost six, seven years ago, my son got to ride on the Danforth during what was called open streets. And they had closed down uh, the street to cars, but opened it up to everyone else. else. And so he was he couldn't have been more than uh, four, maybe five years old. And my son rode his bike from the East End all the way to the Royal Ontario Museum. We rode across the the, the uh, Bloor Viaduct. It was amazing, but he'd never been back on that street since that uh, open streets piece. So we must have done, I mean, that video shows just a small snippet. We must have gone up and down Danforth like 20 or 30 times because he was I'm just like, days. look at me. I, yeah. I'm, on, I'm on the street that you never let me go on. <laughs> well, and that's one of the things I love about open streets events is is it gives um, all members of the community an opportunity mm. to to see public space, their public space, and streets are our largest amount of public space. Yeah. You're able to see our streets in a different way and imagine, oh, wow, mm-hmm. this is kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Yes. That's, that's very, great. Very that's true. great that he he had that observation too. Uh, so what's going on here? It looks like we're going for a ride. We're going for a ride. This was uh, this was a, a brand new um, uh, ride uh, through Baycrest. Uh, this is a hospital uh, organization doing bike for brain health, and uh, they look at uh, keeping our brains active, keeping it uh, well. Um, and finding opportunities to um, uh, do research for uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. My father had passed away uh, a few uh, weeks before this ride, uh, and my son Jack and I did a 25-kilometer ride uh, across the Gardner Expressway and Don Valley Parkway. If you've ever been to Toronto, these two monolith uh, um, uh, freeways are literally cut right into the downtown core. Um, Baycrest was able to organize over 5,000 riders uh, to take over the Gardner and the DVP and use that as a vehicle <laughs> for uh, for fundraising, uh, for uh, brain health. Um, it was, it, it is an incredible feeling being, you know, uh, 15 meters up, uh, looking around your city going, wow, look at all this space. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had, we had an amazing time. It was, it was so much fun. They're going to be doing it again next year. And, and it was a ride for my dad. He, my dad was a, a huge tinkerer when it came to, uh, bicycles. And, and I mean, you know, it's funny that I had said that my, my riding kind of happened, you know, just, uh, you know, four, five, six years ago, I was riding when I was a kid. Right. Um, but as soon as I moved to Toronto, um, geez, 15 years ago, that riding kind of stopped. So, you know, it, it you get it when you're a child and depending on where you are, what city you're in, um, you may not be able to continue it. Uh, so I, I think, you know, maybe this, this comes full circle almost. The fact that I have my children riding as young as they are, um, and, and as much as I may have lost my daughter to wanting to ride in this city, I'm hoping that my son, he's 10 now, uh, I want him to continue riding all the way through, but we're going to have to build 
uh, a city that allows him uh, allows him as a as a young black man, but allows him as as a person on a bike uh, to be able to to do that uh, safely and to to be able to uh, explore. This is a really cool city, and you want to be able to get around, and you shouldn't have to worry about it being in a car. Um, and and one last little piece: this is never, in any way, shape, or form, a fight uh, against walking or a fight against public transit. Right. This is an addition to not having to be car dependent. Right. So take the bus. Be be wanting and able to to walk around your city, uh, but uh, have have the ability also to to hop on a bike, whether that's an acoustic bike, an e bike, cargo bike, does not matter. Uh, you know, we we want to build that infrastructure to make sure that uh, everyone uh, can do it safely. Yeah. yeah. My good friend Chris Brentlett uh, with the Dutch Cycling Embassy likes to say that, you know, riding a bike is just pedestrian plus. You know, you're just able to it's an extension of the, the distance that you can go effectively. Uh, and, and he makes the point of, of saying, you know, that's part of the Dutch style of riding <laughs> as a Canadian living in the Netherlands. Uh, you know, it, it's the, the that, you know, it's just it gives you the ability to reach a a ninefold greater amount of your mm-hmm. city uh you know from from a, a des, you know from a, a starting point w- where your origin is whether that is a transit stop or wherever it, your, your ability to get to meaningful destinations you know it just expands the entire city expands uh if you have the appropriate infrastructure in place to be able to make that happen i wanted to linger on this uh just just to to say you know it's so cool when families can get together and do you know fun events like this i had the opportunity to um participate in the uh tour la nuit and tour uh da il up in montreal and seeing okay. the kids do it and they're just they're so excited and they get to the finish line and you know it's <laughs> it's such it's you're you're creating memories and um and and hopefully you know be able to uh keep that momentum up you know keep Mm -hmm, the momentum mm -hmm. of riding going so that you don't have that same level of interruption that you did with with, you know with zoe uh and and we can't blame zoe because she started to feel vulnerable and you know and that's part of the reason why we've got to get this fixed we've got to get our built environment such that all ages and abilities uh all walks of life you know can Mm -hmm. get to meaningful destinations now you mentioned earlier about businesses and that you know cars don't spend money it's actually (laughs) the people inside the cars and uh and and so in Toronto, I can remember filming in a, a, along a stretch of, of of neighborhood there, and apparently there was just this huge fight. Uh, I can't remember the name of the street. I'll have to go back and look at the footage of that. And uh, but apparently, you know, there was a protected bike lane going to go in, and some of the businesses there locally were fighting it tooth and nail, and it, it did go through and it went in. And then afterwards, they're like, "Oh, we love this." <laughs> <laughs> and but part of but part of the strategy of why they loved it is that the cycling community sort of showered them with love, even though they were hating on the bike lane. Mm-hmm. They just they overwhelmed them with helping them see a different way by you know bringing business to them and making it conspicuous as they ride up and park their bikes and you know make those transactions like oh bikes mean business because you still yeah you you still need to go out and get your coffee you're you're still you know uh popping by the grocery you're you're still buying things um now you're giving me as a person that uses a bike uh that extra opportunity that safe opportunity to be able to now uh, come to your business. Um, I, I, I think that as much as as much as yes, the the cycling community was was definitely uh, overwhelming, uh, not overwhelming, but overwhelmingly wanting uh, to access these businesses. Um, they were they were doing it in the past. You just 
it, it was just more, it was patchwork more so than anything else. Now it's just a continuous flow. It's a continuous stream. If I ride by your business in the morning before I go to work, there's, there's a pretty good chance that as I'm coming back home, I'm going to stop in. I'm going to see what's in there. Um, you know, I'm, I, I have that ability to safely be able to hop on and hop off in such uh, uh, an easier fashion than anyone driving. And the more that uh, these businesses see that uh, continuous interaction, it's definitely, I know it's definitely helped in lessening that argument per se that, well, my business is going to suffer because I can't have these two cars uh, parked in front of my business where you could have dozens of cyclists uh, being able to pop in, pop out, pop in, pop out uh, in, in a, in a better fashion. So it's, the proof is definitely in the pudding, uh, and, and it's getting easier to kind of tame that, uh, one, um, argument, uh, to the fold where you can showcase, uh, different areas of the city where a protected bike lane, uh, really does bring in the business. Yeah. Yeah. And on those streets where we actually have enough space to have a parking protected bikeway, mm -hmm. uh, you might even want, as a business, you might even want to like, you know, petition for one of those car parking spots be turned into a, a bike corral. Because would you right. rather have one potential customer or maybe as many as 12? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it, it's it, it is pretty amazing that, you know, on a bike, even even if you were looking at a cargo bike, you're still the you the 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 amount of space that bikes take up is such a fraction right. to to a car and 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 if you can you know uh uh park them strategically you can yeah you can fit you can fit a lot in that same uh space that would be uh that would be put forth for for a car for sure yeah yeah, yeah. so in your profile out on the the bike's website uh one of the things that you mention in there is um helping employers encourage people to, to, to do a little bit more uh, bike commuting and supporting, um, you know, the, the, the employers and supporting the employees to be able to take a more uh, active mode, a, a more mm -hmm. sustainable mode. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, that initiative and how, you know, how receptive employers are to encouraging their employees to, to take a more active mode. So I got to blame my wife uh, on this one. Uh, my wife, uh, Sabrina, she's a nurse manager at uh, Princess Margaret Hospital uh, in Toronto. We've got a, a full section uh, street on University Avenue where it's got half a dozen of the top hospitals in Canada uh, during the pandemic, even before that, but definitely during the pandemic where public transit was was definitely on a, a low grade Um nurses, doctors, uh, patients uh, would utilize bikes as their means of transportation to and from the hospitals. So uh, following up on how uh, my wife has been going uh, on a bike to work, it really was talking with organizations, talking with BIAs and getting them in, uh, in the know about where their, um, where their employees are coming from. Uh, we know where they need to go. They need to go to work. How to show off, showcase um, uh, the ability to be able to park safely, park your bike safely, get to work safely, creating different uh, routes that they can uh, utilize from home to get to work on a bike. Um, because of uh, the size of these hospitals, uh, they, they have the extra luxury of having indoor parking. Some of them have access to uh, showers. Uh, that's definitely the pinnacle. But um, if you live in your community and you work in your community and are able to get to and from uh, uh, that work environment safely, uh, the more that we can uh, show that, the more that businesses can offer that as an add value uh, to working at uh, your local bank or working at the local grocery, uh, the, the, the less that we have to worry about, you know, your, uh, employee having to, to drive and find parking and pay for parking and doing all of the other things. 
doesn't take away, of course, from public transit or from uh, uh, walking. But within that, you know, five to 10 kilometer uh, circle, uh, if you can hop on a bike and get into work, um, uh, it just it, it it changes the entire game. It changes the entire mindset. Um, biking for for so many people is almost a stress reliever. If we can make it safe, uh, it, it's it is a great stress reliever before you get into work. It's a great stress reliever uh, leaving work. Um, uh, you know, just just being active is is one of those really uh, uh, key pieces that that uh, I want to be able to put forth in businesses' headspaces to to understand that hey, this is this is a good thing. So that reminds me of some of this video that I shot uh, while in Toronto. Uh, I, I think I was it was being led by some members of the city uh, bicycle program and some of the infrastructure. And this was a really cool um, facility, a bike locker facility, indoor facility. They had lockers. They also had mm -hmm. uh, access to showers. Uh, really a, a phenomenal level of uh, investment in trying to encourage more people to be able to uh, make those longer trips, especially when you think about it, you know, from from the standpoint of having the need for a shower there probably right. indicates yeah. that there there it's a much longer trip than That's what, right. you know, the, the typical Dutch would be like, well, why do you need showers at your, your <laughs> facilities? Well, <laughs> you'd understand if you're coming in, you know, uh, 20 kilometers away or something Fair like enough. that. Um, yeah. But the the key was is just the extraordinary level of having safe uh, bike parking uh, facilities and encouraging and supporting uh, you know employees coming in to be able to do that and uh, so I, I I wanted to mention that because I thought it was <laughs> it was kind of fun that uh, you know that's that's one side of it and I'm glad we hit both types of journeys you know or actually mm -hmm. really we hit kind of all three types of journeys in the sense that we talked about the the safe route to school, you know, from from yeah. your kid's perspective. Uh, we talked about those utilitarian trips, getting to those businesses and, and shopping and doing those daily trips, and then also the commute trip. Uh, too often in transportation, we focus overly on the commute trip. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. it's like, yeah. It, that's one of the trips, but especially for women, there's oftentimes trip chaining. You know, they're doing a lot of care mm -hmm. trips and a lot of little shorter trips uh, in addition to maybe that commute trip as well. So, uh, good good stuff. Now, occasionally, the bike mare gets to meet a real mare. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this? Oh my gosh! Yes, uh, the mayor of uh, Emmer. Emeryville, uh, the home of Pixar. That's uh, John uh, Bouter, uh, a phenomenon uh, on Twitter, but uh, just one of those amazing voices that, and it's not just preaching about bikes, it's, 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 it's really opening up the conversation about how we can change the way our cities uh, work for everyone. Uh, he is an avid cyclist nonetheless, but uh, he's talking about walking. He's talking about public space. He's talking about uh, how we can transform our streets. Uh, he put out a tweet uh, at the beginning of the year saying that, hey, you know, I'd like to take a look at a couple of cities. And uh, we, we had a uh, Torontonian, actually, we had a Hamiltonian uh, uh, basically throw up, Hey, you should come, you should come up to Canada. Uh, and, and John, uh, replied back. If he got a hundred replies, uh, for Toronto, uh, he would be here. Uh, we, we, we did well over a hundred <laughs> and, uh, a couple days after Canada day on, uh, on July 3rd, we took a 25, yeah, just about a 25 kilometer ride, uh, together showcasing a lot of the uh, infrastructure here in Toronto, going down Young Street, going across Bloor. Uh, we brought them into um, the distillery district, and it was a it was a wonderful ride. Plus, uh, he spent probably two three hours just talking. Right. just giving his time as a mayor yeah. and I, and 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 let's be you know he's a mayor of of of, of a town of 13,000 people that's that's yeah. smaller than 
my ward. I've got 120,000 people that just <laughs> live in my ward. So, and he makes that very clear that there is a that there is a seismic different difference in size. But yeah. um, where he really hones in is you still have to open your front door to the street. If you're living in an apartment, you're coming down the stairs or an elevator, you're opening yourself up to that street. How does that street work for you? How does how does the safety of that street allow you to do the things that you want to do? And in that regard, it doesn't matter how big your city is, you want to make sure that uh, when it comes to active transportation, uh, that it's being done safely. And John has it down back. And, it's, and it was such a a uh, wonderful opportunity to share his voice uh, to um, constituents here in Toronto and just give him a really good time. It was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun too, just seeing how on bike Twitter he's he's just exploded, you know, as <laughs> as you know the, the the bicycling mayor, you know, as, as for real, <laughs> for real, yeah. Uh, and it's not fair because he's not a single uh, topic, you know. You know, no, no. mayor, and 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 he's he's fighting for affordable housing issues. Yes. You know, there in the Bay Area, and and many. So, it, I mean, it's 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 not fair to just you know brush him with that stroke and say, oh, he's just yeah. the bicycling mayor. No, no, yeah. no, no. I mean, yeah. he's, no, no. He's, he's yeah. There, there's a wide portfolio of what he is tackling and how he is doing it. The participatory method in allowing for his constituents to have that voice for him to amplify their needs and to really fight for them. Uh, it, it's definitely something that I hope other mayors uh, across North America are looking at and wanting to, uh, to copy and paste. I, I say that a lot. Copying and pasting is not a bad thing. Um, we don't necessarily have to look to Europe, to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam to figure out how to build uh, safe uh, streets for constituents here in North America. And every city is going to be different. Uh, Toronto has a, you know, here in Toronto, we'll, we'll look at Vancouver, we'll look at Montreal. Well, oh man, why can't we? We can't. And, and that's okay because Montreal is set up a bit differently than Toronto and so is Vancouver. We can build things that work for our city, that can work for uh, for the the population that's here, uh, the the one single grain is to make sure that it's it's safe for everyone. Yeah, I mean it's it has to be authentically safe and inviting, uh, yeah. and and I I look at safety as the bare minimum. <laughs> you know, it's, that's the bare minimum. It has to actually be inviting. It yeah. has to be yeah. if we want a vibrant, thriving city and community that really treats people with dignity. It should also be beautiful. It should actually, you know, so safety is the bare minimum. Yeah. And, yeah. and then beyond that, hey, let's make this amazing. Because if you make it amazing, guess what? You're going to get more people using it. For sure. Oh, From yeah. a behavior change perspective, it's it's like if you really embrace people and you really treat them with dignity, guess what? They will respond in kind. Uh, you know, if you're going to try to drag people out of their comfy environment in their hermetically sealed luxury vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, you might want to have a bike lane that's, you know, a little more attractive than, you know, a concrete barrier, you know. You want it to be that magnet. You want it, you want it to be sticky. You want them to come back again. Uh, uh, I love these... that word sticky. I love <laughs> it. I love it. Because, because some, of the, some of the best uh, uh, cycling infrastructure is that infrastructure where you'll see a family yeah. being able to ride yeah. uh you'll see young kids riding on their own yeah uh you'll see you'll see seniors yeah. that haven't been on a bike in a while yeah. uh taking the opportunity to to get out there so uh those are the those that's that stickiness that's yeah. that stuff that it brings you back and you want more of that and you you want to do it again and again and again yeah, you're speaking my language here with health behavior <laughs> change. Yes, the stickiness, you know, creating friction, uh, you know, when friction is needed to be able to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, try to move that behavior over to this side and the stickiness of making it, you know, really attractive so that that, that new behavior, that healthy behavior, that positive behavior, that sustainable be behavior sticks. I love it. Fair it's good enough. Stuff. Yes. It's good stuff. Yeah. So... 
in closing us out, I want to bring to this picture up because <laughs> this is it. I mean, this is why you're doing this stuff. This is your family. Yeah. Talk yeah, a little yeah. bit about how um, it, it's, you, you, like you said, you got you you came into this role in the middle of the winter, and uh, not not the best time to sort of launch it. But you know that's the, this is the reason why you're passionate about this. Close us out by talking a little bit more about um, what you see moving forward in, in in the future, and and what gives you hope. You know, both my kids are are very responsive to um, the climate crisis that we're in. And they realize that, and they're 14 and 11, the likelihood of them getting a driver's license, even wanting to drive is, that's that's literally not on the table for them. Um, they want to be able to get around uh, by by bike, by, by walking, by public transit. They want to do that uh, throughout you know their their lives here in Toronto and um, it's going to be up to myself up to my wife to really amplify their needs and um, you know it's it's a hard it's a hard challenging piece to uh, um, to really look them in the eye and say that yeah, you know we've tried Um We've got to do more. We've got to push more. I think realistically, uh, over the next uh, two to five years, uh, you're really going to see that friction uh, hit with vehicles just not not being the the primary uh, uh, mover of people. And I think cities in general are going to finally hit that tipping point, understanding that. Uh, the car centricness, the car dependency that we've been doing for a hundred plus years is not getting us forward and that we need to be able to uh, turn to our public transit, making places easier to walk to and making them safer for cyclists to be able to ride to. We're going to be pushing in that direction um, uh, more so. The political will is definitely going to be needed but uh, voices of family members, voices of individuals, uh, we got to get louder. We got to get louder, and and I'm seeing that already. And so, you know, just to just to wrap that, it's um, I live vicariously through my kids, and and I'm blessed and lucky enough to have them as uh, the the best motivator. Uh, but they're bringing along their friends, they're bringing along uh, their families. And they're looking for uh, as much uh, amplification of that need for uh, a safe and healthy environment for uh, everyone to be living in. And, uh, you know, that's 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 honestly my mission is to give them that. Yeah. We've mentioned political will uh, multiple times. We do need that level of leadership. Uh, you've run for office in the past, <laughs> uh, but a lot has changed since back then, because that was a few years ago that you did that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So because we do need leadership, like John Botters, we do need that level of leadership. Um, are, are, is that something that you would consider doing again, running in, in the future? I think that I am very happy being able to throw the peanuts from the gallery on this side. Okay. <laughs> I'm definitely uh, there to help and and to guide uh, new and younger uh, occupants to to a to the seat of uh, of where our politics need uh, to be. Um, and I'm happy to you know to put myself on the side to to allow. Um, bigger ideas and better ideas and more uh, equitable ideas to be uh, put forth. So uh, I'm on the side, but not too far away and uh, and definitely here to, to help as best as I can for my community and my city. Yeah. Yeah. So helping get those people elected into, into office, because like you said, I'm all you, have, there. <laughs> you, you have to have that representation there at yeah. that local yes. level. We know that that's so important. Um, you know, Kathy Tuttle and I talked a little bit about how important it is to have, you know, the, the, the higher levels too. And, and, and depending mm -hmm. on the structure of the city, you know, sure. having that representation right. at the, at the mayor level in, in that suite. Uh, but, and then obviously, you know, positive representation at even higher level at the national level. Uh, yeah. So incredibly important. Uh, 
Lander, thank you so very much. It's been an absolute <laughs> joy and pleasure uh, chatting with you here. Thank you for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This was, I said it was going to be a lot of fun. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so very much for giving me the opportunity to, uh, uh, to just, you know, be able to, to push out uh, the, the wonderfulness of being able to, to ride a bike because it's a lot of fun. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Landrick. And if you did, please remember, give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Leave a comment down below and uh, be sure to share it with a friend as well. It's really, really important that we get these messages out uh, outside of our bubbles. <laughs> so it's really important to share the message uh, within your network so that um, we can spread the word. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just hit the subscription button down below and also ring that notifications bell right next to that button uh, that gives you the ability to customize your uh, notification preferences. So that really helps out a lot. And if you're enjoying this content, uh, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Uh, just head on over to patreon.com slash active towns and uh, you can become one of the activity ambassadors and you get some pretty cool benefits uh, from that as well including early access to the content uh, via commercial free <laughs> as well as uh, discounts in the active town store and uh, speaking of the active town store you can pick up your own paint is not protection coffee mug and water bottles streets are for people some fun active town swag out there uh, again i don't make a ton of money off the store but it's a wonderful way to spread the word and uh, again every little bit helps it adds up and you know keeps me going so thank you so very much for tuning in uh, i really appreciate the support and it's always wonderful to have you along for the ride uh, and until next time this is john signing off by wishing you much activity health and happiness cheers <laughs>